to me a little bit more about, you know, how you grew up and kind of how that shaped your journey in, into fitness and whatnot and some of the struggles you went through. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, I think a lot of a lot of times when I talk about you know, getting into fitness or getting into even the type of fitness that I got into, I realized that if I look back farther, 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 it largely was influenced by me going into martial arts when I was young. Mm. And so how young were you? You started martial arts Four. Oh, wow. But but that comes from a bit of a struggle, too. So my dad, he grew up, you know, he's half Japanese, half white, you know, and, and say like the 60s, and even in California, if you didn't fit in to one particular group, then you yeah. weren't you weren't in any group, you know, so right. like and everything was very segregated. So like mm -hmm. one block would be this type of culture and another block could be a different culture. So if you didn't fit into them, when you end up on their block going home, you you oh, might yeah. you might be fighting your way through that block, you know. Yeah. It was a little different, different vibe. Right. So when I was four and we grew up kind of in a rough, I grew up in a rough part of town. I'd come home without my toys. My dad would be like, well, hey, you know, where's your toys? I don't have a toy. You got taken away. Well, where, did you get an ass whooping? No. All right. Well, then the rule is you either come home with a toy or an ass whooping or you're going to get the <laughs> ass whooping when you get home. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they put me in martial arts because I, I didn't really have that. that gotcha that uh, inherent protect self-protective yeah. mechanism where I'm like, Oh, my stuff or whatever. Yeah. So, so what was the martial art you started with? It was actually a pretty eclectic mix. It was boxing, judo, jujitsu, and karate. Oh, wow. So that's kind of where that's influenced this whole idea of like integrating a lot of different methodologies to create something that was, you know, synergistic, hopefully, you know, yeah. like we're, we're, we're not using clubs and maces just because we're club and mace people. We, right. we use them, in context with every other tool, whether it's barbells and clubs and maces and yeah. dumbbells, like we use, we use everything. So it came from that kind of idea when, so somebody, you always hear that old saying, you know, you, you wrestle a boxer, you box a wrestler. Mm -hmm. And so with the skill set from that dojo, that's kind of the way we were able to go about things, right? If somebody wanted to, to punch me, I'd grab them and throw them on their head. If they wanted yeah. to grab me, I wanted to punch them in the face. You yeah. know? So it was, it was, it was a cool, a cool and eye-opening kind of perspective to have and not even realize the implications of it until later. And, and how did that affect you going through school and your, your self-confidence and, you know, your, your interactions with other kids? You know, I was shy. So like I got into the dojo and, and I, I, I was intimidated, man. You know, to be honest, I was like, I was somewhat of a timid kid, which is why my parents wanted me to go to the dojo. Yeah. And the first day I went there, it was like, got slammed on my back by this, this gal that was a couple of years older than me and was a badass, you know, I didn't know any better. Right. And from then on, I remember just like fighting my way. I don't want to go <laughs> this <dojo. laughs> yeah. uh, for, for a while. And then, uh, and I realized as time went on, the, the physical discipline and the, the code of conduct really helped shape who I perceived myself to be. And I realized like, Oh, shortly thereafter, you know, you're doing this really hard, calisthenics conditioning and martial conditioning you know i could do like a couple hundred non you know unbroken push-ups of course wow. when you're like yeah. seven yeah, yeah, yeah levers yeah, yeah. are shorter right, right, right. And, and it's a little different but still i was like oh wow and uh i was you know i relived being shy i relived being timid various times of my my growing up because okay. i was more like a, a nerdy kid that had mm. thug friends that mm. could, could play physically enough with the jocks, but it wasn't really one of any of those things. Uh -huh. um, but I always thought, well, the, the, the lessons I learned in terms of my character and then the physicality I developed in those younger years, developmental years carried me through so that I could jump in and play with the jocks rough, yeah. or I could hang out with the thugs and not be perceived as a, a non, I mean, with them, it was like, you had to at least hold your own, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> or, but, but then my nature, what I really was was this this geeky nerdy kid that ended up in you know a lot of the honors classes. So, you know, when everything was said and done, it was kind of an interesting thing. I think that martial arts influence allowed me to kind of walk through different yeah different Super scenes. Cool. You know, it was right. a little different. And this is up in Northern Cali. Yeah, yeah, Monterey, Monterey Bay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And it's, so, so when do you first really get more serious about strength training and fitness and kind of heading on that path that you're on now? 
Well, I mean, I don't know if it's serious, but you know, everybody in high school, you know, it's curls for the girls, man. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, I had my little weight set up in the garage okay. and I remember doing so much, so many curls and so many pulling exercises that I remember going to the office the next day and not being able to straighten out my arms. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I don't think ever, I think everybody's done that to oh, themselves yeah. at least once, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Give yourself T-Rex arms. Yeah. And so I remember that at that phase, it was, you know, very very bodybuilding influenced, mm -hmm. right? You know, every, everybody was reading the the most current articles on how to pump up your chest and Flex magazine. Yeah, Flex yeah. magazine. Yeah. That's all there really was back then. Yeah, dude, yeah. you know, it was it was really interesting uh to to realize and look back like how how narrow our perspectives were, yeah. but because that's what media was what, what was available. Yeah. And so so I, I did that. It's so funny to people who don't know now, like the younger generation, that's literally all we had. Like now there's so many different ways to train and everything, but all we had was bodybuilding. But that was it. That was it, yeah. man. That yeah. was it. I mean, and who didn't want to be, you know, swole? I mean, yeah. now, now you got gains with the Z. Yeah. You, yeah. Didn't, you didn't have <laughs> that, that term back then. No. You know, you uh -huh. just wanted to be swole. You wanted to be you wanted to be big. And and, yeah. and so um so that was the the pursuit there, but that actually wasn't when I got serious into training. That was still just more, you know, cosmetically focused. They kind of just yeah. pumped the ego, which is fine for me too. I mean, yeah. I think it was it was a great experience there. I was always kind of prone to putting on muscle, so it was something I, I did okay in. Okay. But uh actually I, I ended up kind of doing making other lifestyle choices. Yeah. That were far from healthy and well. Well, let's talk about that a little. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> So I was really good, like I said, as a shy kid growing mm -hmm. up. But when I got into senior year of high school, I started venturing off into more social scenes, right? Okay. So it's different parties, different stuff, started smoking weed. I realized, like, well, um, I'm good at procuring quality weed. So then, then all of a sudden, next thing, next thing you know, someone was like, well, John, I, I want some of that. And I'm like, well, darn it. Now I need to get more so I have enough for me. Yeah. And that went down the road of, of becoming – uh, recognizably, you know, recognized as somebody who could procure things. Uh, and so that went from weed to uh, early 2000s, you know, or 99, the the rave scene was, was popping. Yeah. And so I got into that scene and then it was weed and ecstasy. Okay. And so uh, that was fine and dandy. You know, I, I really felt like, you know, I was riding that wave pretty well. I was still managing a career up in Silicon Valley working in uh, tech sales and doing things like that and just having a grand old time on, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sundays, yeah. you know? And, uh, <clears throat> and so that was, that was fine until it wasn't fine. So I got introduced to, to meth one night and because I was achieving in different aspects, I was going to school, I was working full time. I was still partying and, and running this, this alternative lifestyle at the same time. Right. You know, as it was like, well, when I needed to perform, I was crashing and the only way to perform again was to reintroduce this this substance. And yeah. so I fell into that and like in a week I was like defeated. Like nothing has ever like just defeated me that way. Wow. And so uh yeah. Getting getting down that path, I ended up being hundred and thirty ish pounds, 130, 135 pounds, yeah. uh strung out on meth. And then fitness, the the real my Evolution to what I do now and the perception of. So, so John, how many how many years was this? Like, how, how long was this stretch? Oh shit, like a year and a half, probably. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, where I was using meth to like, to the point where I try to dis decide like, oh, I'm I'm done with this, and then another six months to be able to like wean myself off yeah. of it. But it was all fitness, so fitness was my vehicle for overcoming the not the physical addiction, but also the mental and emotional aspects. During that, that year and a half, were you training at all or no? No. Okay. So yeah. then what was, what, what, what helped you make the switch? Like what got you back into fitness? Well, so like I had, so when I was, uh, you know, a street pharmacist, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I would only dealt with my friends. So yeah. it was like, you know, I tried to make sure, you know, I had an inner circle of people that I worked with and trusted. And yeah. I just, one of my friends was like, you our relationship was never transactional. My my relationships with anybody tend to be more relational and want want to be long term and like yeah. nurturing. So, so my buddy was like, "Hey, who are you? You're not even the same person you were before. You're like this shell of a person, you know." Mm -hmm. He grabbed me and he, he was crying, and I was just like, "Man, I should really I should really feel something because I'm generally empathic, and I didn't." And wow. I, so I I went home and I reflected on that, and I was like. 
I'm he's not the one that's usually emotional. I'm usually the sensitive and emotional person, but I didn't feel anything. Huh. So I was like, oh, this is there's something really broken with me, you know. And so there was that. I met uh, a woman who ended up being my my ex wife now, you know, and that was a eye opening experience. And then the third thing I really attribute to is just being like coming to the realization that like, okay, well, I'm this messed up. I'm hurting other people than than myself, which was the story I was telling up to that point is it didn't matter. I'm just hurting myself. Right. But I started seeing how it was affecting everybody else. Right. And then, then coming to terms with that, I realized like, I'm going to go tell my mom because she knows I'm messed up, but she didn't call me out on it. So she's giving me the space to self-correct. Mm. So I went on, I was like, I, you know, you haven't seen me very much for the last year. And I know you, you know, I'm, I'm not doing right right now, but I was just going to tell her, you know, Hey, uh, thank you for not calling me out on that over this last year. I'm sure there, it was hard not to like try to get involved in a way that maybe you would have pushed me further down that road. Yeah. But don't worry about it. I, it might take me a little while. I'm going to fix it. So, so, so those, those three things were what I really attribute to, to, to being able to like make the mindset shift. But a lot of the lessons from martial arts and applying that into a newfound pursuit in fitness, that's, that's been the vehicle to kind of climb out. Right. And so, so how did it start? How'd you get back in the gym and how did your training kind of evolve from, from that time to what it is now? Well, you were, you're talking about what magazines were available, yeah. right? And so the, the, so up to my high school years, it was like flex magazine and, you know, muscle, uh, muscular mu development, muscular development yeah, yeah, all these yeah, yeah. super veiny these <laughs> close ups on pecs they are flexed yeah. as hard as they could and stuff like that. And, uh, then, at this point in time, it was this really cool thing happened. I found Muscle Media 2000, mm. and then there was somebody who wrote a column in it, and I found the writing was uh, pretty phenomenal, and the, the way that the information was presented was, was highly actionable and practical, and, and it was witty. I was like, well, who is this guy? It was Pavel Satsuli, right? Okay. Yeah. You know? Your great neighbor. writer, great writer, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and he does have the most amazing way of just simplifying things and making you understand it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I was just like, well, this is so simple. Can it really be true? And I started putting into practice the things that were were shared month over month. Next thing you knew, I was reading all of his his writings. You know, all the different books that he'd published through Dragon Door at the time, uh, Super Joints, Relaxing to Stretch. Uh, power to the people power to the people was my like gold mine bible for rebuilding oh, yeah. my body yeah so okay. simple yeah um just two exercises yeah. every day pretty much i added a little bit of stuff so you know uh just to satisfy my wants yeah and changed up the program just a little bit but the 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 principles of the program were there and really clearly laid out so it was really easy to adapt it and man it was that was like the start of of this whole journey it was like man he opened my eyes to a lot of different perspectives that were contrary to what we'd been taught up to that point. Right. And then, uh, and then through him, I found some of Scott Sonnen's work. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then man, the rabbit hole just went really deep, you know, between the two of those worlds connecting. And, you know, a lot of people were like part of one or part of the other, but they didn't know how to bridge them. Yeah. And so it was really, I felt like really uniquely able to kind of say, well, okay, well, just because you swing clubs doesn't mean you can't swing kettlebells effectively or vice versa and just be able to contextualize the differences and, and, and grow from both of those unique and very like not diametrically opposed. They're like two sides of the same coin almost. They're like, they look so different from the outside yeah. in, but if you like, if you get it, then they complement each other really well. Right now. So when you first discovered Pavel stuff and started getting into all the kind of unconventional methods, you were you weren't working in fitness at the time. You were still working, and like, uh, what, were you, what were you doing at that Man, time? At that time, let's see. I think I was probably working hotels, um, like hotel industry, inside sales, and different okay. tech stuff in Silicon Valley. So, what's Valley. the evolution of how this becomes your career? Oh man, well, you know, so when I teach seminars all the time, I always ask people, how many of you here just here for personal improvement? Right. You're just you're just not you don't make money doing this. You're just here to invest in yourself. And we get a good percentage. I'd say at least a third of the people that are there for for gotcha. their investment in themselves yeah. rather than in their career. And I love and I love that. Shit yeah, because I, and I tell them, I was like, well, you know, when I started going to my first certification seminars, it was the RKC and the CST okay. certs. And both of them were September 2003. Okay. So and I didn't take a dollar 
for training somebody until 2007. Okay, wow. Um, so what happened was... So during you know, those four years, you're experimenting, you're learning, you're going to workshops, all that kind of stuff. Going to workshops and yeah. then like having training groups in my garage with anybody nice. and everybody who would show up yeah. and developing, you know, my voice and developing a way that I can integrate these different things yeah. in one deliverable. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. I was, I was doing, you know, I was in hotels, I was working, um, insights or various different sales gigs, outbound sales or inside sales in the tech industry. I got into behavior sciences, working with autistic kids in a classroom setting, got into mortgage, Wow, all that. <laughs> all that stuff before I transitioned into fitness. And at first, fitness was kind of a part-time gig, and as I was get, weaning myself out of the finance industry, mm-hmm. and then it was just like when when the stock market crashed and everybody was, you know, losing their houses. I hadn't didn't have a way to help anybody, and people were crying in front of me. I was like, oh, this is not what I signed up for. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go do this fitness thing. Everybody's broke. But everybody is broke. So the first thing that you can do is invest in that you're always going to net a return, a positive return, is is invest in your health and wellness. So I just figured, yeah. hey, even if everybody was broke, I can design something. It was like the age of the boot camps. Yep. So then it was like I was just doing boot camps in the park, city-sponsored events and, and a lot of charity work. And, man, that, that's, that was kind of like the transition into going part-time to half-time to – to full time okay. in the industry, and then eventually you opened up your own training facility, right? Yeah. So, like at first, we uh, let's see October two thousand seven, I kicked off a boot camp program in the park parks. But hey, it's California. October is the last little bit of nice weather, and then it started getting cold and yeah. and darker. You know, right. and and at the parks, I realized, oh shoot, people live here at the park. I didn't realize, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's at six a.m. Yeah, uh, we're doing this workout, and and there's some poor people sleeping yeah. right over there. Yeah. You know, so it really didn't work out so well for the right vibe, for our members and, and and for the business part of it. So we started looking at, well, what do we have to do next? And so we looked at, we we used the inside facilities at the at the park, the the location we're at, and then we partnered with somebody. Um, and shared a facility for 18 months. And that was, man, it was so great. You know, I think people people always get so fixated on being rigid in the way they first kick stuff off. Yeah. And they bite off more they can chew. Total, huge mistake, yeah. But, man, Keep so, the overhead low at first. Yeah. That's a great idea. I, I always recommend that to people, like, rent space within another facility. That's a great way to do it. Man, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and even, like, when you first kick off, I'm, you know, it's nice to be at a gym where they have like 10,000 members and you just learn how to talk to people. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that's where you're going to really flourish, yeah, but yeah. it's a good way to get a lot of repetitions and figure out how to get a spiel going, you totally. know? Totally. Great point. Yeah. Cause it, too many people just immerse themselves in training knowledge and then eventually business and sales. It's like, but if you don't know how to talk to people and build relationships, forget it. Yeah. You None have to inspire, matters. Yeah, yeah. You have to inspire confidence early in yeah, the process. Yeah. So, so yeah, you know, I was kind of like doing some stuff at gold's, and then it wasn't really like the right spot for me. So transitioned into that boot camp strategy and then um, got this shared facility. It turns out that I was looking, you know, you dream and you start looking at like, oh, I'm going to look at these properties. I know I can't, can't get them, you know, mm-hmm. I can't afford them. But when I talked to the property manager, she was like, oh, well, what would you use the space for? I was like, it would be a, a fitness facility. Oh, the other people looking at the space are looking to do the same thing. I was like, well, that's serendipity. Give them my card, you know? Huh. And, uh, turns out there are a couple that I trained one day. They were both black belts at this martial arts studio. And I did a little kettlebell workshop for their black belt cadre. And so when we, we went and had dinner, it was like, Oh, we already had a great vibe and, and had built some trust. So we, we shared that facility for 18 months. And then, and then we kind of were, both of our programs were growing. So we were like having a hard time squeezing everything into this one space. Okay. So I hopped over to my own facility 18 months later, but you know, I, I, that's something I would really recommend. I, we talked to people and people that are making good money, like say engineers or other things, or they want to make this quick transition into fitness. And I was yeah. like, they want to just go all in and start a facility. I'm like, man, there's a huge learning curve mm-hmm. here. Yeah. 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 It's a big mistake to do that like that early. And, and then so so how long do you have your own place for? Uh, and and was, was there something between that and on it? No. no? So, okay. so yeah. So 2000, December 1st, 2010, I opened my, my studio. Yep. Um, how, how big was it? How many square feet? It's like 5,000 square feet. Oh, pretty big. Pretty big. And yeah. it was, for me, a big part of that was hosting 
education was okay. a big part of what I wanted to be able to do and to yeah. have a big enough space to host certification seminars, things like that. Yeah. So the main room in our facility was about 3,000 square feet. And then the, and then the, there was used to be like a flooring store. So then you had like the front area. And that was largely unused for a long period of time. It was more like just congregation space. You yeah. know, the kids would hang out there if their parents were working out with the front desk person. Or we would use it as overflow, stretch, you know, cool down area or stuff like that. Yeah. But it wasn't the most efficient, but it was still like, man, it was great. It was like. I secured that place for like 65 cents a square foot, you know, for at first on the first lease. It was great. Yeah. I was like, man, that's, so, <laughs> that's so it, insane. Yeah. Yeah. It was, <laughs> well, I mean, the economy was in the dump mm. and, you know, I was a young up and coming business person in the town, which is small enough so that if you do a couple of good things, people know who you are. Yeah. And I just did a lot of charity work. So they're okay. like, oh, you know, I hear your name. I hear good things about you. Um, you know, you're a contributing member of society already. So people were down to do nice things, got this great, great facility. And I was there from December, 2010 to when I first, uh, interviewed it on, it was April, 2014. Okay. So I was there for, for a handful of years. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was great. And then, yeah, April, 2014 interviewed with on it about kind of education, designing their education system. And then April, August, 2000. 14 it was a hop hop over to to austin now, full time. now what led you to make that decision because a lot of people having their own facility things are going well wouldn't really leave that so there had to be a pretty good offer that you were pretty excited about pretty happy about what was it that was so enticing to you yeah so before uh before even when i was running and you my had facility, to move too had to move yeah yeah so so before I, I took the job with on it i was part of another organization that did education. I would travel around and help teach their courses. And I really found that that was... Do you want to mention what that is? What was it? Oh, that was RMAX. So that was okay. uh, Scott Sonnen's okay. organization. Okay. Uh, so they have their circular strength training yep. curriculum, and then they had a tack fit program. And then I, I was the U.S. director of operations for their organization for, for quite a while. And so I figured out, like, man, I really love teaching these long you know, seminar format mm. stuff. And I really love designing education and the experience designing mm. an, uh, an experience for people to thrive in. And so, you know, that, that relationship dissolved. And so for a while I was kind of floating around and uh, during that time, instead of just like putting myself on an Island, I was really like, well, Hey, in that community, it tended to be somewhat insulated, you know? So like a lot of communities, you know, you stay in the community, yeah. you know? And so, so what I realized was like, well, the, Hey, there's this, big open world around me that I didn't fully immerse myself in just because I was so focused on servitude of that community and, sure. and, and my role in that community. So started inviting more people to come provide education. And then when the deal with Onnit came around, you know, it re reinvigorated this, this vision I had, which was to, to actually be able to teach on, on a platform and make a big, make a splash, make a little bit of a perspective shift to how easy it is to implement a lot of this other stuff that seemed, you know, esoteric or ethereal and, and, and use it like for somebody who likes bodybuilding, use it for somebody who likes CrossFit, use it with somebody who likes, or is a, a you know, conventional team sport athlete. Yeah. And then, so that it didn't seem like this weird stuff, but it's something that we can integrate into everything, every type of style of training. Right. And so on it provided that type of platform because man, the brand is sexy. The, the perception before I got there was like, there's this, all these resources. Right. Mm -hmm. But then, um, in whether, whether that's the case or not is a small feisty scrappy company where we're all sharing limited resources when mm -hmm. I realized, but the, but we also share a passion for execution. And so, uh, leaving to work at on it was just this opportunity to kind of advance this vision I had already. And I realized more and more and more trying to do it on my own with just my, the resources I had yeah. and in my little studio, it just wasn't, there was not going to be the type of traction that I right. could have. So I just figured for better, for worse, I'm going to go do this. And it's been a wild ride. It's been awesome. Yeah. So, so talk about, um, the evolution of, of when you first got there to what you do, cause you've taken on an expanded role now. Yeah. So all the stuff that you do, you have done, you're doing. Yeah, and man. And you guys just launched the uh, a new program, right? Yeah. So yeah. that and that's that's kind of this cool thing about the evolution too. So uh, I got recruited um, at On It. My predecessor, the first chief fitness officer at On It, was Mark DeGrasse. And so 
he helped recruit me in to fulfill a role around education. So he said, well, I'm not primarily an educator. I'm an info marketer, right? And so they, he's like, well, John is the kind of guy that you want to bring in for this, this type of project. So they brought me in to design a certification course and then to help run the gym eventually. So I was like, okay, cool. I can, I can do that. And like you said, my role expanded Yeah. because as, as Mark parted ways with on it, it was like this, this is a vacuum. Like someone needs to fulfill this role. And so I got tapped on the shoulder for that. And I was like, man, a little stressed out because like I knew how to teach seminars. I knew how to run a gym, done that before, but all the expansion of these responsibilities was like, man, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to have to figure this out as I go. Right. And that's been great. But, uh, you know, a big part of the original strategy, and, and we're just now getting around to it, is beyond the gym and beyond the education component is to fill in like a funnel of, you know, a low barrier to entry to more premium info products mm -hmm. and, 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 and being a content producer. And so now, you know, as time has gone on, I've been able to do stuff like help design cool fitness products like the Marvel stuff or the LucasArts stuff or... Um, help design more courses and now we're kind of coming full circle and, and we're, we're really going in at that like premium content play with a, a six week transformation program we call on at six. And so this first iteration is a body weight one, but we're going to be doing uh, probably six different programs, six, six week programs. Okay. Uh, and they all highlight different methodologies within the system. So like the first is body weight. It'll be kettlebell. We already filmed. Then a mace one, a restorative, like ground-based one that uses light clubs, um, and then kind of continuing down a couple other methodologies. So it's 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 kind of cool, and hopefully it opens the door to like this whole new reality where we're producing a lot yeah. of cool content. Yeah, I love it. Now let's talk a little bit specifically about your training philosophies and your style. Because I mean, I see some of your stuff on Instagram sometimes. I'm like that guy's Superman. Like it's amazing. Like. For you to be jacked, strong, so mobile and athletic, like how does someone do it? Like, let's walk oh. through it. Like, um, where do we even begin with this? I mean, so, so talk about like, I mean, you went into it a little bit, but you you integrating all these different styles and 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 you know where does strength come into play? Where do powerlifting moves come into play? Where does some hypertrophy work come into play? And how do you how do you prioritize all that? Yeah. So what was great about this, say like the Honest Six program, is just like the same thing, right? It's like well. You and I were chilling yesterday and we we're talking about, well, it, it's great to have uh, a lot of fun and some a lot of diversity in our training. But every once in a while, we're going to want to focus in on a particular outcome, a yeah. particular goal. Right. So, you know, and even that that term like focus. Well, how many things can you focus on? Yeah. Well, you know, in, in our day and age, we're, we're trying to focus on a multitude of different things. Yeah. And even in in the uh, question we're talking about, well, how do we do all these things? Well, I still do them in with more narrow focuses, right? So, like, the nice thing is our platform, our system is really holistic in the sense we – the joint mobility components are non-negotiable. So, you know, uh, you're not showing up and just doing a wad and then taking off after you just, like, jump in with no warm-up and there's no cool-down. This The restorative aspect of our system is a non-negotiable part of the whole deliverable. So yeah. we're going to spend probably as much time – prepping the joints and warming up the body and cooling down as we do in the work component. So like, say if, if the workout's an hour, maybe 30 minutes of its actually work, you know, the meat and potatoes yeah. that most of us value. And a lot of it will be preparatory and then cool down base. And so if we keep it really simple, that's really the gist of it. But we use a variety of different tools or different methods in the prep, in the cool down to amplify the effects. And we borrow a lot of information from people that are really smarter than us, you know, like, a, you know, the body of work that we have, we are always integrating new stuff. So hanging out with Doc Chang the other day, yeah. you know, when he came out and lectured, uh, we're taking a lot of notes. I'm like, Oh wait, that the way he presented that nugget of information that changes the way we look at a couple of things uh, throughout the whole system. So we're always taking in information and like, letting it cascade through and seeing where things fit, where the puzzle pieces fit. So for us, like standing open chain mobility drills where, you know, you're basically, if you're familiar with the FRC or mm -hmm. uh, Andre Ospina's work, we do a lot of stuff like that. So there's, that's, so Sauna's work, Z Health, FRC, you get a lot of these like joint circles 
uh, as part of your practice. And it's hard to understand, well, why? So we try to make it really simple and, and, and put that into play. And then in addition to that, we'll do like you know, positional activation drills or ground-based movements, just patterning different rotations. Like most of the body, the way we move, whether we acknowledge it or not, is just we're, we're rotational movement creatures. We look at everything from a, a conventional training standpoint is up, down, forward, back, right? Yeah. But when you look and at that's all most people do. Yeah, and that's yeah, all yeah, most people do. Yeah. So, so now we're looking at, well, even if it's a lack of rotation, th that means there's stability, right? Because mm -hmm. our body wants to rotate around and find the path of least resistance. So even rotational doesn't mean that the presence of rotational movement, but sometimes the rotational control, rotational mm -hmm. stability, right? So so we look at like, well, how do we prime the body up for the thing that we're going to focus on? Do that, hammer that out. Maybe we look at that as like a conventional power lifting or even a, a, you know, like a power output type of thing. But I might focus on one thing for you know, 10, 15 minutes, get mm -hmm. a good amount of volume in mm -hmm. a five by five, even, or, yeah. you know, five, three, one, whatever the case is, whatever protocol we want to use. And so we still never give up that old school strength mentality. And then we can do all kinds of extra stuff. That's just complementary to that. And so we're always looking at, well, how do we put the puzzle pieces together? A lot of it centrates around what, what my primary focus is. If it's strength, then I might do something like you know, five, three, one, if it's a hypertrophy type of situation, maybe I'm doing a, you know, escalating density training, you know, for 15 minutes and then doing some complimentary work thereafter. But we always are just looking at trying to keep a balanced approach. So even if I want to get really strong and I realize like, oh, I'm a little stiffer, the next training cycle, maybe, you know, if I give up yeah. some range, then I'm like, okay, well, the next training cycle, I'm going to flip the focus and do a little bit of strength work, try to not to lose as much of what I gained and then focus on regaining any of that lost mobility. So let's do a couple specific examples here. Let's say a guy's 37, hasn't done much training. He's messed around here and there since high school, but he's like, all right, I have my wedding in four months. John, I, I got to get super lean and I got to look good. Like how, how would you set that up? Would he, would he lift three days a week? What's that look like over the course of seven days? Yeah. So, What's really cool is a lot of times what we're doing is kind of hybridizing the, the approach a little bit. So I, I like to get people in and work with them on the front end. Maybe this guy, I'd work with him maybe three days a week okay. because I want the technical proficiency to get up to par. My mm -hmm. par tends to be kind of high. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to be able to be hands on, work with them a lot. Um, but at the same time, we might want to look at, well, setting the groundwork for later success so mm -hmm. a lot of times people are always chasing like one thing for me i really have enjoyed is but i think is underrated low intensity cardio mm -hmm. type of activities mm -hmm. and not necessarily just for like burning calories so i think that's where people like yeah. miss the miss the the whole boat totally it's like for stress management for mindset for for awareness uh just for local circulation mm -hmm. you know like getting getting the body to reset so that as we go through, if we can increase, uh, and I was talking to you about this the other, if we can increase the amount of healthy movement that this person is doing on the front end, yeah. build a bit bigger base of, of potential, like, uh, uh, what was, was the, uh, adaptive reserves even mm -hmm. like, so keep the threshold pretty low, get the strength gains to come with minimal cost. And this was something that I heard at a, a recent, uh, lecture I did the plan strong, Mm. course uh pavel did in colorado a while back they they, oh, were, they were you at that that was at that one okay yeah, he invited me out i couldn't make it that week right? oh I, man I it was it's great though it was it's great and yeah. he he came up with a term that i really enjoy and i've always i've always thought it but i just didn't come you know sometimes someone has to say it and you're like oh duh yeah yeah the, the biological cost uh -huh. of training so yeah if you could get strong strong without taxing your systems right then that's your foundation so say we got four months. We spend the first four weeks really setting this foundation, increasing the low intensity activities so that, you know, there's a nice reset. There's a, a reduction in systemic stress. Yeah. And really, dude, all that is so important because people overlook that, especially in the Instagram culture. Like everybody just wants to go hard and beast man. mode and no days off. But it's like, 
dude, you're already stressed out of your mind at work and with your family. You're not sleeping well. This person's you know? getting married. I'm, yeah, I'm guessing yeah, that yeah. it's a little stressful, yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you're right. You know, people overlook that. Mm -hmm. And But the, the reality is. At and you were even saying that, like, you had to adjust your training over the last few months to, uh, you, you know, uh, because your stress management wasn't where it needed to be. Yeah, man. So you got to, your training has to reflect that. Well, yeah, you have to take into account what your yeah. actual, like, what your body's really able to do, right? Yeah. And I don't think people can, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so wrapping up slow is really great. And, you know, the reality is, like, it doesn't have to be outrageously taxing on your body to get net some really positive gains, especially if we're just setting a foundation. Yeah. I don't have to do it all the first four weeks. Right. This first four week cycle is just, it should be almost like, easy almost like are you sure this is this yeah. is really gonna get get us where we want to go and yeah. then yeah the honeymoon's gonna be over in in two more weeks don't worry about it you yeah, know yeah, what yeah, i mean yeah. so yeah first four weeks i like to set set the base there if this but is even though the honeymoon's gonna be where i don't i don't imagine that you train people like they're not leaving like it's a an intense bodybuilding or crossfit workout where they're just on a pool of blood and piss and sweat on the floor like you always kind of train a little sub maximally more so yeah well, once Except in a maybe, while yeah okay. yeah so like i like uh so there was a quote the other day, um, Dr. Mike Nelson put, put up and he was talking about, uh, it was a quote from Rich Froning mm -hmm. and he said, uh, in training, we learn to listen to our body in mm -hmm. competition. We tell it to shut up. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like, you're right. I prefer more often than not managing stress of training mm -hmm. in a way where, well, what are we, what is the goal of training is to net an outcome. So it's not to stress you out. Yeah. It's not to make it so hard that you do something that actually diminishes the positive out, uh, yeah. impact of training. Like if you're doing shitty reps to finish the assignment, I'd rather not, right? You know, I, I can make it harder in a lot of different ways. And and so, but every once in a while you do, you have to, you know, you have to have a high intensity day thrown in every once mm -hmm. in a while where you're like, well, that's my edge. Yeah. Oh, my edge, my edge changed. My right. line moved forward, but I still know where to find it. Yeah. You know, this, it just might've been, and, you know, you can test against, you know, your maximal load or, or a conditioning protocol where you're scoring something and gamifying it. But every once in a while, I'd say, depending upon that particular athlete, you know, once every four weeks, once every six weeks, you know, really go at it hard. But intermittently, like once a week, usually I like to make sure they have something that they can they tap to that 90 percent mark. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just gratifying, you know, and I think that. um a lot of times people, they, uh, psychologically they need, totally. they, they need, that's a rewarding experience. Yeah. yeah. Now, so, so more to the specifics of the program, you mentioned building in that low intensity stuff. You, you said three days of, of harder training. Yeah. So, so you, you're doing the, the warm ups, the mobility, uh, and then what, what would you do? Like something like we talked about yesterday, maybe like a five by five on two exercises or something. And then, yeah, two or four exercises might be like two escalating density, uh, cycles, you know, say okay. like a superset. A and the superset B okay. and keeping and then monitoring and compressing over that four week time period, the rest intervals. So maybe okay. looking at more like an EDT. Okay. And so like gradually over that course of time, seeing and you do that all three days, something like that, something like that. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I prefer keeping it again, relatively low, low threshold and increasing the volume and doing, letting the, the compression of work and rest happen naturally over the course of, that four week cycle. Okay. And, and what happens is generally a lot of times people are just, you know, I'm not pushing their pace at the end. They're just like, they're recovering so much better. The low intensity. So what's really fun about this, this kind of duality is that low intensity cardio output that they're doing builds a, a aerobic base that drives recovery in their strength training mm -hmm. sessions, Yeah. which, you know, and I like to break those two things up. So like a lot of times I'll like, well, I, I prefer you doing, low intensity fasted cardio like well how hard well you should be able to breathe out your no in and out of your nose the whole time or have a conversation i don't want it to be intense at all okay. it's really not about build, burning as many calories as possible at that time but can, uh, for a lot of us especially if we're stressed out body doesn't necessarily sh do too well metabolizing fat ox oxidizing fat mm. so so for me that fasted cardio component a lot of times i'm having people do like mindfulness practices during that focusing on their breath. Yeah. Like how do you monitor intensity? Well, we can look at how you're breathing at any given time. It's a pretty good indicator. And secondarily, like, uh, you know, I mentioned Mike T Nelson trying to build something, trying to take into account what's likely the case, which is most of us don't shift between 
our metabolic flexibility or efficiency is not very good. Like, so that's why keto diets are so pro profoundly popular now is like, like, Oh, I wasn't burning any fat. Now I know how to, hmm. to metabolize fat. So I like a like really softer, more gentle approach with that fasted cardio. It's old school bro science, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but the reality is, is we're doing it not to burn the maximum amount right. of calories, but to shift the body into a state where it can burn fat more readily. Yeah. <clears throat> hey John, will you keep for for that guy who hasn't really lifted that much? Those will be body weight and kettlebell exercises mainly, or will you go with some barbell stuff? Yeah, I like barbell stuff. Yeah. You know, to be honest, uh, again going back to the power to the people stuff uh -huh. that that we looked at, like um, I'll do partial range instead of what they're doing, pulling from the floor every time. I might do some partial range RDLs. Really okay. use use some of the concepts there with a lighter load. You know greasing the groove and working with some external load and using that external load even as a way to elicit uh, flexibility gains while building strength yeah. gains. I think that's one of the things that when we look at building a foundation, a lot of people aren't looking at, you know, they're thinking about moving the weight, but how we move the weight determines so much of the, the training effects. So like uh, high hinge RDLs with submaximal loads, but only, you know, partial range to below the knee and all the way standing just yeah being under under load for that period of time starts teaching bracing techniques and then right. and lengthening those hamstrings under load man you can get way more flexible doing that than just trying to stretch every day yeah um so that's something that i really enjoy and then and do you tend to favor like pavel like multiple sets of lower reps or will you do sets of 10 to 15 or anything like that for this initial phase i usually like lots of sets of lower reps okay. so again kind of focusing on that reducing the biological costs yeah. sets of three to five depending yeah. upon what they're we'll talk about is. that a little bit because i think there's a misconception uh where people think that lower reps and, and maybe you have a different take on it but a lot of people think well lower reps are harder to recover from because there's more stress in your cns but that's also relative to the, the intensity to, to the load how, yeah, yeah exactly yeah. and then also bodybuilding workouts sometimes well people are like well it's easier to recover from sets of 10 to 12. not necessarily and if you're doing a ton of volume taking those sets to failure not at all yeah. So I think Talk we can qualify that, that really, yeah. really well. So like I might be using sets of five and basically using like 60, 60% 60 of a one rep max. It's yeah. like really, really light, yeah. you know, 50, 60% of a one rep max sets of three to five. And it's, it's like, okay, well it's enough to, to, to make you your CNS respond, mm -hmm. but it's more about cr exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's really finding that, that nice line where recovery from between intraset recovery. And at the end of that workout, you should feel like, Oh, things are, things are really working. But the goal again, over the course of that four first four weeks was compression of that work. Yeah. So at first the goal is actually to encourage them to re take longer recovery sets, even they, like you feel fully recovered. Okay. Let's take a couple more breaths and then we'll go ahead and get into this one and really kind of let that compression happen naturally over the course of the four weeks and, and not rushing it, you know? Yeah. And so again, even the load, the load will, will naturally increase, but incrementally, I'm really not looking at like the traditional, like say, okay, well it's a five rep. So I want it to be closer to 80%. Mm. You know, I, I actually want to keep it lower and add volume through repetitions versus through through loading up each repetition maximally. Yeah. Okay. Now now let's flip the script because we, we have a lot of beginners who listen, but we also have a lot of guys who've been training for 20 years. So let's say it's me, you, Aubrey, Heisen, Luca, and we say, John, all right, you get a million dollars, we got 90 days, we got a superhero role. Uh -huh. And it's you and I as we, as we are, Aubrey, all those guys training 20 years. We got to get Jack. We got to gain 15 pounds in 90 days for this role. How, how's the training going to be different then? Oh, shit. Everything's on the line. Everything's yeah, on the yeah, line. Yeah, oh, yeah, man. Yeah. So, you know, honestly, you know, it's, it's bodybuilding and aesthetics has not necessarily been something I've been focusing on to this degree. But well, you're jacked and you help people get jacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. No yeah. doubt. So, so one of the things that I've actually, it's funny you bringing this up. I'm actually working on, well, I've realized my personal claim to fame is, I'm jacked and mobile, right? Yeah. And, and my conditioning is pretty good. So I can do all the things yeah. um, pretty well. Yeah. So what, I remember a friend of mine called me a ninjilla. Oh, you know, yeah. you're, like, you're like a gorilla, but right, right. like a ninja. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that. So I, I'm actually putting together some material that'll be reflective of this particular goal. Okay. And, and a lot of it would come back to something similar, but a lot more intense okay. in terms of the big 
compound, big, heavy compound lifts. Mm -hmm. In this case, we're definitely loading us up a lot more. We have 90 days. We have, yeah. you know, the training ages that we have. Yeah. We know where our edges are. So it's not a general recommendation. Yeah. It, it yeah. was like, hey, all right, hey, Jay, you, how do you how do you feel on this lift? Where's, where's your where's your one rep max? Where's your three rep max? Yeah. I love three rep maxes okay. personally. I use that as my my driver of intensity versus the one. Okay. I just find that uh, the risk to setting that understanding is so much lower. Yeah. You know? So um, would you still train three days a week? Would you train four? Would it be full body? Up oh lower? no, we we're going six days a okay. week. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, even that that last example, three days a week of of strength training. They'd still have their off days, three days a week of low intensity movement. Yeah. So. Well, that's what I meant. I mean, as far as the strength training. For, six, for six us, days? for us, we're probably going four uh -huh. on the strength training and two, uh, moderate moderate intensity body weight conditioning. So for okay. our people in our training age, our recovery workout would be would look like a, a low to moderate intensity uh, circuit or interval kind of workout. Yeah, so true. it would be. For some people, that would be a, a moderate to high intensity workout. Yeah. And for us, realistically, especially if we're just moderating the intensity, it's like moving meditation. Like yeah. after you move a bunch of weight, sometimes just moving that ass around yeah. is medicine, right? You need yeah. to you keep the blood flowing. And so on a four, two, and a, a and, and lots of recovery built in. So, yeah. you know, the nice thing is with people like us, we're, we're more prone to going and doing what the contrast baths mm -hmm. or, you know, getting in for the infrared, having some mindfulness practices to bring the overall stress reduction down. I think one of the things with people at higher training age, they know that to keep up that level of intensity, they have to have those restorative practices built in. Yeah. And that's where a lot of other people, like when they get into more intense training, that they don't realize that there's that extra investment of putting it back in the bank. Yeah. You know, with you guys, we're like, well, if we say, and we'll probably all do it together. Yeah. We're all going to jump into the infrared sauna. We're all yeah, going to, yeah, yeah. hey, let's go get this IV therapy real quick. You know, yeah. like, I think that one of the things is, is if, if you're going to be pushing it that hard, you do have to know you're going to have yeah. to do a lot of extra work just For to sure. keep it all together. And would you have that be uh, like an upper lower split or full body? Yeah. Upper lower split. Yeah. So, so I like, it. Uh, so, if we're looking at, at that, that week, so if we're looking at four days, mm -hmm. so I like to do an upper, lower, full body, and then that week would be driven, the focus of that week would be either an upper, lower. So we'd either do a second upper or second lower. And okay. then so that the next week would kind of alternate. Gotcha, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that way you, you're, you're, you're going to tax something you're going to have a slight bias yeah but that bias will change week in and week and out would you periodize those days like to, like a heavy day a heavy low heavy upper heavy lower and then more rep based or something like exactly that? Yeah. exactly okay. yeah so so it's it's always moderating the volume and the load right yeah. so I, I like to do things that are more biased towards right so the meat and potatoes would be biased towards the lower lower rep higher sets and yeah. then that supplemental day would likely be more moderate, moderate. So moderate reps. So probably into eight and twelve reps, yeah. and then and then. Now, in that scenario, would you dip into going closer to failure and bodybuilding techniques, or do you still like to keep it more submaximal? I think that last day, I'd yeah. like to see where we can get a little bit. You know, reducing the load and getting yeah. that that nice pump, right? Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's something that like I don't do often enough. Yeah. But man, would we? hormonally there's such a you get elicit such a huge response from yeah. finding that edge i know a lot of people are using occlusion type of training yeah. these days for that I, and i like that but um uh, you know i'm i'm more traditionalist my approach is yeah. I, like i want to actually move the weight that i want to be able to move right. i just get a lot of gratification from feeling that in my in my grip so even if i can get the hormonal response i i might want and the occlusion training i like for like traveling and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, I'm at a hotel gym. We only have yeah. these little, these little dumbbells. It's okay. I got these, yeah. these, uh, these straps I can use and kind of amplify yeah, the impact. But if I'm at my home gym or if I'm with my boys, I just, just grunting and, and moving real weight yeah. is, it's a, such a more primal and innate, like innately satisfying experience. Yeah, for sure. Now you mentioned a bunch of recovery methods there. Uh, any other ones that you're, you're a big fan of? Oh man. So, a dry needling. Okay. I've been seeing phenomenal outcomes from that. Uh, recently had a couple move from Arizona to Austin 
and they do fascial stretch therapy. Yeah. Oh, great. just to be able to be passive on the table and yeah. have people move, move you around through ranges. You feel that, awesome after one of those sessions. Like drunk. Yeah. I, yeah, I was like, <laughs> yeah. man, this is really intense. Um, the, the experience on the table is so passive and so gentle. And then afterwards to, to feel such a big shift is pretty awesome. So dry needling, fascial stretch therapy, um, really got to cold plunges, you know, with Wim Hof coming out and doing something for, for the Onyx crew. And then just seeing, seeing all that we had a, uh, we had a cryo chamber, a cryo unit at, at the gym and that was cool, but there's just something different about yeah. having to kind of endure the discomfort yeah. and like calm the mind. I think there's just such a, there's a valuable thing there. Totally. That, did you guys get rid of the cryo chamber? We did because we got so much more uh, interest in IV therapy. Okay. So we started doing IV pushes. Uh -huh. So it's really nice because instead of having to sit there with a the bag for, you know, 30, 45 minutes, yeah. you're not getting, unfortunately, you're not getting all the fluids, the saline, but you, you're getting all the, the vitamins and amino acids in like 30 seconds. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's, nice. that's kind of an intense experience. You get warm and flush and fuzzy. Really? But then afterwards you feel phenomenal. Do you guys have ice baths there now? Not not no. a, not on site right now, but we will probably be oh, cool. acquiring some, even if it's the old school, you know. Yeah. You know, so some people are just using their you know like freezer units, yeah. with, right? Yeah. And just totally. keeping it, yeah. keeping it cold. So, um, yeah, I think we'll probably be doing that more. But I've been off site in different facilities, yeah. like going out to Phoenix to visit Exos and then jumping into their cold plunge, and I'm just like, oh man, this is. There's something to this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and you mentioned sauna. You do sauna quite a bit. H how often would you ideally do sauna? Uh, I like to get in the sauna three times a week. Okay. Yeah. And we have an infrared hybrid sauna at, at on it. So mm -hmm. I just realized, like, man, you know, that technology, it just, um, the more I looked into infrared saunas, I'm like, oh, man, this is, this is really legit. And then yeah. to experience it is actually it feels actually very significantly different just like oh like okay you, you can kind of imagine if you understand like the implications of that technology and then and go in there you're like i feel like like my innards are, are secreting you know toxins <laughs> right, like, right, right. like this is good you know yeah um and you kind of the heat penetrates your body in a different way you know? yeah yeah and uh what about nutrition wise what are you uh <laughs> This is not my area yeah. of, uh, of, of Which contribution. Did, did you do a little keto run there for a while or no? So when I was dropping you, that. Did you drop like 30 pounds or something? Yeah, 35 pounds wow. in, in like two months. Yeah. And it was mainly just um, really low carb in the day. Okay. So I'd be riding that kind of keto edge mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out, you know, how far into the day I can run that low carb, low calorie type of input especially after that fasted cardio component in the morning. I just listened to my, it was like the best therapy for me is just really low intensity, sub threshold stuff and listening to audio books. Yeah. And I was like, man, this is great. So that would be my morning. And then I kind of try to be as productive as I could on like a, you know, like, like a high fat coffee or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I start figuring out like, okay, around this time I need to have a little bit of something, something to keep my blood sugar from crashing. Cause at like three o'clock, once you once I was crashing, I was like, man, this sucks. Yeah. Um, so just figure out where that edge was. And then like from that point on, I just kind of like delay up the intake of any significant amount of carbohydrates until a dinner. And then I'd refeed, you okay. know? And so, so it wasn't like keto. It was more like, yeah, it was almost like, so what would you have during the, the middle of the day there for that one meal or snack or whatever it was? A lot of it would be, uh, so some of the snacks we have it on it. So we have like these keto shakes. Okay. So the high fat, low carbohydrate version of, of the shakes that we have on, on site already. Yeah. So, you know, instead of having, you know, almond milk and half a banana, it'll just have coconut cream, Yeah. you know, and man, it's pretty freaking delicious. Yeah. But so that, you know, one of those will carry you over pretty good. And then maybe I'd have something that had like light amount of carbohydrate, you know, 20 grams or so midday. Mm -hmm. And then at night, um, this is the, what was so great was because I was doing that so consistently, I just, went to whatever restaurant I wanted to and just didn't oh, nice. eat, yeah. just didn't eat an outrageous amount. Sure. Like, so yeah. th their portion is always like half of that portion. Okay. Um, but, but you'd be so, having carbs at night. Like, oh like yeah, steak man. Steak and rice or something. Steak right? and rice, yeah. tacos, whatever, yeah. man. Yeah. I mean, but the, I think it was just the consistency of the output, very similar to what we were talking about. Like if we wanted to, to really go 
and see a, a shift in our body. Like sometimes less is more, you know yeah. what I mean? And so like, and then just being able to do that, this is actually just very similar to the recommendations that, that Aubrey has in his book on the, mm -hmm. on the day. Right. So it's just like, okay, not everybody needs to be like strictly keto. And for me, I needed those carbs. I definitely did. Cause, yeah. uh, recovering day to day, it was fine for me to be low carb for the morning. But if I, if I didn't get that, the, those carbs for me at the, the state, the amount of training I was doing, I noticed a couple of days I went low carb at dinner Yeah, and the recovery okay. wasn't, wasn't right. where it was supposed to be. How, how many carbs do you usually eat a day? You think? I eat a pretty decent amount. I, I tend to do pretty well on, uh, I mean, it's rare that I'll be below 150. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the training days, I'm, I'm probably closer to 300. And I, I can stay pretty lean with that. I actually get leaner. So if I go lower fat and higher carb, more of a traditional bodybuilding style diet, I get leaner. The trade off is I don't feel quite as good. Uh, I don't think quite as clearly. Maybe inflammation's a little higher. Um, and then, you know, as you get older, I don't think you want to sacrifice healthy quality fats, you know, when it comes to your skin, your joints, your hormonal profile. Now there's all this stuff about brain health. So you, you kind of trade off, right? It's like uh, when you're younger, you just want to look good. When you get older, you're like, man, I want to feel better too. I want to think about longevity and health. So even though I could be maybe slightly fuller looking, more pumped all the time and a little leaner on a, on a lower fat, higher carb diet, I kind of like the, the overall health benefits and how I feel of a little higher fat and less carbs. But, but for me, like even 300 grams, I mean, that's still pretty high, but I used to be like 500, 600 grams every day. Yeah. Yeah. So. What, what are your favorite carb sources? Uh, sweet potatoes and white rice. Japanese yams specifically. I love Japanese yams. Huh. I like, I like them 10 times more than regular sweet potatoes. Japanese yams are killer. So now I now I have to go shopping. Like, what are yeah. these Japanese yams? Jeez. Oh, dude, they're the best. Have you never had them? I don't know, man. Dude, they're, so they're yellow. They're almost the color of like this table. They're yellow. And uh, you put a little sea salt and coconut butter on it. Forget it. It's like a dessert. All right. So good. Uh, I, that, you might be shifting my focus yeah. away from some of the uh, the less healthy carbohydrate options I choose. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Uh, any favorite books that you, that you like? Except not like non-training or uh, just like any kind of books you, you usually recommend? Or Man, you know what? It's so funny. One of the books that I've read over and over and over again, um, I remember my dad or my uncle had this book, The Ninja. So we talk about ninjas, yeah. but it was it was funny because it wasn't really just about ninjas. It was about espionage and governmental, like 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 say Japan, Russia, and the U.S. and the Cold War and everything. This so was all written in the '80s, but it was a uh, I just loved that freaking book. And so then uh, it's just what's funny about it was just, just uh, last year I was doing a tactical course at a uh, in Albuquerque, and Shane Hines, our director of education, was there. And I see him with this novel, and I look at the novel. I was like, what? "Is that the Miko?" It was the second book of the Ninja series. Oh, wow. okay. I was like, I was like you, "Is that your book, or do you find that in the room?" Either way, it's weird because yeah. I know I know this book, and it's pretty kind of a weird series. I don't think a lot of people. He's read that series multiple times. I've read that series multiple times. So okay. I was like, "Ah." Oh. I know that this totally non-training stuff. We talked about ninjilla, you know. Yeah. I'm part Japanese, if anybody didn't know. So yeah. maybe I'm a little obsessed with ninjas. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but uh, who wasn't? You know, right. in the '80s. Oh, Come no, on. I was, I was obsessed with ninjas. Yeah. All right. So, good. Yeah. Don't leave me hanging on that one. No. Jay. No. No. Obsessed. obsessed. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, maybe I've read that book too many times. But it was it was funny when I saw him have have one of the books in the series. It just made me flip out because you know you have your homies that you've known forever. And then you realize that there's another common thread yeah, between yeah, you and yeah, that yeah. person that you never even assumed. Yeah. It was crazy. Totally. My brother, this was long overdue. I'm so glad we got to do it. Now you got to get running. Uh, tell everybody where they can find you and, and uh, the new programs and everything you got going online. Yeah, man. Uh, so best way to find me is on Instagram, uh, Coach John Wolf. Wolf spelled like the animal. And then uh, – And you do some amazing stuff on there. You got to do more – I need more training videos from you on there. So it gives me something to aspire to when more, I grow up. More training videos, yeah, yeah. man. Okay. I want to see you doing your, your freaking ninja shit on there. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I've been getting a little a little gun shy on there. I noticed yeah. lately. I've, no, no. You got to uh, keep, keep it cranking. All right, man. All right. Yeah. So more shirtless ninja stuff yeah. on, the, on yeah. the Instagram. Yeah. For, for some reason, shirtless gets – Exactly. Three times, three yeah, times yeah, as many yeah, likes. Go figure. Um, but most of them are dudes. I don't understand. The, I don't understand how that yeah, works. That's me from multiple <laughs> accounts. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jay. Hey, much love there. And then uh, check us out over at Onnit. Um, 
the the program that we're talking about uh, on it.com slash six you can spell it out or just the number six and uh we'll be adding more and more stuff to that that's going to be a lot of fun for me if, if you've followed my career or if you, you you're just kind of catching up uh, that's kind of like the biggest single project that I've been able to accomplish and uh, on the shoulders of on it and our team really thankful for all the support we've had through that. So if you get a, get a chance, check that out and uh, let me know what you think. And, and are you still coaching the certs and everything there? Or are you, you're okay. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah, so definitely. You, yeah. So they can find all that on it.com on it.com. Yeah. And that the certs live on the Academy. So if on it.com slash Academy or on it, Academy.com is kind of like our, our, where we proliferate our message of total human optimization across all the different channels, you know, whether it's nutrition, mindset, uh, lifestyle, fitness, obviously. And then on there, if you click on certifications, you'll see a list of all the different courses that we're teaching. And, and uh, I don't teach all of them. We have a whole cadre of master coaches that kind of travel around and teach that are, you know, better at their individual specialty than I, uh, you know, I'm really honored to have that team, uh, all kind of be part of this community, but, but I'm definitely still teaching some of the foundations and durability courses. Um, I co-teach the barbell course right now. So that, that's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, man, I love teaching. Uh, hopefully, uh, some of you guys listening, uh, maybe we'll, we'll bump into each other at one yeah. of these courses sometime. Yeah, definitely get, if you get a chance, definitely learn from one of the best and, and the coolest thing, not only one of the best teachers and coaches, but one of the best people, uh, yeah, everyone I know has nothing but great things to say about you. Just such a pleasure to be around. And and Bronx has only loved one other person that he's met first time <laughs> as much as you. So you got that nod of yeah. approval there too. Awesome, brother. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. John, appreciate you. We'll talk to you next time.